pray with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that you would send your spirit now. Lord, uh, this is a difficult topic which we are about to discuss. We ask for your protection as we do it. We ask uh, for purity of heart and of mind that as we critically reflect on these issues and these questions that you would guide us, that you would be with us, and that you would deepen our understanding and our appreciation of your holiness, of your goodness, and of your love. Lord, I ask for these students as they uh, think through their lives and the world around them, as they think through your word and how it relates to um, those who they care about who are not Christians. I ask that you would, above all, uh, fill them with a sense of uh, peace, a sense of your nearness. I ask, Lord, that you would grant them uh, courage and conviction as a result of this time that they're spending. And above all, Lord, I ask that you would fill them with uh, a deeper love for you, that they would grow in the knowledge of your grace, the knowledge of your truth. These are weighty things, important things, Lord, and uh, we are not worthy to handle them. And so we need your help. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, the one who died for us and who rose again. Amen. I am going to ask for the next hour and a half that you do one thing. Um, that you feel free to engage the, the content that I'll be uh, presenting critically that as you are listening, that you would open up your mind to the questions that come in. Not that you would ask the questions immediately, but um, that if you write anything down at all, that you write down the questions that you have that seem like they have to be answered or else your life will somehow be imperfect. I would ask that you actually not write anything else down. The reason why God invented video recording is so that you wouldn't have to take notes. Um, which is a serious point. These things are worth engaging with everything that we have. They're worth engaging with our entire heart, our entire mind, and even, dare I say, our entire body. And it's difficult on a Friday morning after several days of conference to be engaged, it's difficult to allow the, uh, to not allow the tiredness of the body to get in the way of learning. And that will be the temptation for you today, all day, not just this morning. And so I would ask, not demand, ask that you work, that you strive for the next hour and a half to not let your tiredness from the, and, and, and your fond memories of the fun of the night before get in the way of you hearing, potentially, the word of the Lord to you today. There's a concern, I think, when um, we get together and we talk about apologetics as Christians, that we do so from a posture of fear. That we inculcate this sense that others are opposed to us. And that unless we can master these six arguments for the existence of God, we're just not going to make it in the world. Now, there is definitely opposition out there, and I don't mean to minimize that. You will have challenges if you go to a secular university, and you will have challenges if you go to a Christian university. Shockingly, I don't know if your parents have told you this, but not everyone in a Christian university is, in fact, a Christian. And some of them will present ideas and opinions to you that need to be challenged and questioned as much as if you were sitting in a secular university listening to your postmodern professor do his postmodern uh, thing, if we can call it that. 
But I worry that when we talk about apologetics, we exacerbate this difference and we set up too much of a contrast such that it is us versus them. And they are the persecutors and we become the, the lonely persecuted band, the faithful remnant who alone are standing up for justice and truth. Now, when it comes to the existence of God, mostly the people that you go through, uh, the, the people that you meet who are concerned with rigorous arguments for the existence of God, once you leave the university setting, mostly those people will be uh, weird folks on internet message boards. There aren't that many people out there who, the, through the course of their daily life, are reading very good philosophy. They'll read Christopher Hitchens, but I wouldn't include Christopher Hitchens in the category of very good philosophy. It's not. So they're thoughtful people, but they're not necessarily rigorously thoughtful people. And so they have opinions, and they might hold those opinions strongly, but they're not necessarily going to be hostile to you for believing in God. Why? Because we still live in, an, in a culture where the majority of people in this, this world believe in God. The cultural pressure as Christians is still on our side. It's rarer to be an atheist than it is to be a Christian, which means the atheists are all very loud and angry about it, and so they get all the attention, but really, the people who you meet throughout your daily lives will most likely be totally cool with you being a Christian, except in this respect, if you hold to traditional Christian teaching about sexual morality. It is the single area, increasingly, where it is impossible to be a Christian. It is absolutely impossible to be a Christian and to not experience the beginnings of social marginalization and stigmatization. Now, those are both big words that basically mean that other people won't like you, won't want to spend time with you, and will actually call you names. My church runs a, uh, an open forum every month at uh, Schlafly Bottle Works. And it's an open forum. We invite everyone into the community and we talk about controversial issues. And I occasionally moderate these discussions and they're a great time. And we have people come from all walks of life who like uh, thinking hard about the world. And I, I got into a conversation a few months back with a very intelligent young lady, a Wash U student actually, who um, was convinced that on the question of homosexuality, to be a Christian is simply to be a bigot. Now, if you don't know what a bigot is, a bigot is basically someone who hates another person, who dislikes another person for no reason whatsoever. Racists are bigots. And racists are wicked. Racism, a sin, full stop, no qualification. Her position was that if you think homosexuality is wrong, you are no better than a racist. Now, I spent an hour and a half talking with this young lady. An hour and a half, mind you, in one-to-one -one conversation. I'm a decently thoughtful guy. I've written a book, two chapters of which cover sexuality. I know the arguments a little bit. And I made the case, as best as I could, that as a conservative, Bible-believing Christian who thinks that homosexuality is not God's plan, for human sexuality. I have, in fact, principled reasons to object to that behavior, and I can hold on to those principled reasons while still loving my gay and lesbian neighbor. Now, I'm making this case, and at the end of it, she says to me, well, I still think you're a bigot. Now, this is dispiriting to me. This, this just deflates me because I've done the best that I can. I've presented all the best arguments that I possibly know to simply make the case that I am in fact not bigoted, that I can love my gay and lesbian friend, even while I object. 
But she says to me, I still think that you're a bigot. But, and I say, oh, well, there's, there's hope coming. She says, you're a likable bigot. <laughs> now, if the best that we can do is likable bigotry, that's not good enough. And what it means is that if you, if you are willing to do the work to understand the teachings of Jesus on the question of sexuality, if you are doing the work to present that as charitably, as kindly, as graciously as possible, as sensibly as possible, culturally, we are in a position where you will not be spared from the charge of being a bigot. And so regardless of what education you go to next, regardless of whether you go to education at all after you leave high school, culturally, this is a point where Christians are vast becoming not only the, not only the minority, but a minority that is actually marginalized that is treated like we treat the Ku Klux Klan. Because within our contemporary understanding of sexuality, to object to homosexuality is to be no better than a racist. Now this is in fact a problem. I hope you can feel the weight of this problem. Which is why I ask for your attention. These are weighty things. These are the things These are the things that will actually cause you to be tempted to leave the faith. Because your friends and your professors will not understand why Jesus doesn't allow two men who are gay to experience a lifetime of love together, ostensibly. And so if there is a place right now where you need to do the hard work and gird up your loins and get prepared, good friends, this is the place. This is the area. Now, that's the sort of hard work. That just sets the context. That establishes the terms of play, if you will. The reality is, and here I'm going to say something that I think you might find difficult, which is why, again, I said you should open yourself to the questions that come into your mind and write those questions down. The reality is that evangelicals, the sort of people who go to schools like Missouri Baptist, and the sort of people who attend the journey, have by and large accepted and been enculturated by the secular understanding of sexuality. Which is to say, if you peel back the layers, we might look different on the surface. On the whole, our marriages are better than, than uh, if, if you attend church regularly. The odds are you will not get divorced. That doesn't get said a lot within our churches, but it's actually true. On the whole, externally, we're doing a better job at sexual ethics than those around us. But if you peel back the layers, if you peel back the layers and you start looking with inside our evangelical churches, what you realize is that our attitudes, our mindsets, our worldview about human sexuality is functionally the same as our friends and neighbors who are not Christians at all. We are all secularists now. We are all pagans now. And here's how I know this. I have seen, I tell you, I come to report, I have seen the 40-year-old virgin. Now, I don't know if you know the 40-year-old virgin. Uh, the one thing that you should know about this talk is that I am in fact, recommending that you not ever watch The 40-Year-Old Version because it's not worth your time. It's, in fact, a crass movie that was very popular when it came out. It's uh, with Steve Carell, who you might know from The Office uh, and who is very funny at times. 
but it tells a story about, guess what? A virgin who happens to be 40. It's a remarkable premise, really. <laughs> the way they work that title together with the plot is just, I mean, that's the sort of storytelling you can't get anywhere but in Hollywood. <laughs> they tell this story of Steve Carell. Now, ostensibly, weirdly, weirdly, the 40-year-old virgin ends up being a very pro-marriage film. So Steve Carell, at the age of 40, realizes that he should get married before he has sex. And so he does, to which I say, two thumbs up. Getting married before you have sex, that's the right message, kids. But the problem is, all the pressure against him is to what? Have sex. And why is he still a virgin at 40? Because he has deep principled reasons about the nature of the human person and of human sexuality? No. It's because he's a middling man who doesn't know how to talk to women. He's weird. He collects comic book figures. Now, if you collect comic book figures, that's okay. I'm sorry, I don't mean to insult you. It's all right, it's an okay hobby to have. And he actually makes a lot of money off of these comic book figures, right? But their point is, their point is that you can't be, their point is that you can't, in fact, be a cool, professional, fully mature, fully developed human being without, without getting married and having sex. Now this is how I know we are functionally the same as the world around us, because the pressure within our churches is in the same direction. There was actually a New York Times story last year, and if the New York Times is reporting it, you know that uh, this is probably the case, because anytime they get anything right about evangelicals, it's a little bit of a miracle. They told this story, and they raised the question, why are there no single pastors of our churches? Why is being married and having children a requirement to be a pastor, a shepherd of the people of God? Do you realize that this is a problem? If your church can't hire Jesus or St. Paul to be the senior pastor, we might be in trouble. Now, I'm not saying that it should be a requirement. I think that's, in fact, wrong. I think it's good to have married people as pastors, and I think we need to listen to their wisdom. But what we cannot communicate is that in order to be fully human, you have to get married. Because, let me be very practical for a second. Right now, in the United States, we have more people who are single than we do who are married for the first time in history. And some of you in this room may face a lifetime of singleness through no choice of your own. Because girls, there aren't very many guys worth having. And I have friends who are reaching their mid-30s, who have loved Jesus their entire lives, who are some of the most godly, beautiful people that I know, who are still single through no choice of their own. And that's hard. And they're being forced to grapple with the fact that there are lots of women who love Jesus, but there are very few men. There are lots of boys who pretend they love Jesus, but there are very few men. And so if our message is that you have to get married in order to love Jesus, we are doing it wrong. You do not have to get married to love Jesus. Jesus is single. Take refuge in the fact. And your understanding of human nature and of human sexuality has to account for Jesus' singleness. Now, Jesus being a single person rubs against the entire culture of our, uh, our, our entire sexual culture. You see this, right? To be human in our culture, I'd suggest that there are three things that you have to believe. Uh, the first is that... This is where I turn to my notes... The first is that sexual pleasure is a good worth having so much 
that it trumps everything else. It doesn't matter if you know the person or not. It doesn't matter what the conditions are for the sexual pleasure that you're pursuing. It doesn't matter what comes out of the sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure is an argument trump card. It feels good, so I'm going to do it. As long as, let me add the corollary, as long as it's not hurting anyone else. And you can hear this when your friends say this sort of thing about homosexuality. Well, it's not hurting anyone, is it? Right? I think we've heard that a time or two before. Which is to say, as long as it feels good, and as long as it's not hurting someone else, then it is okay to do. Verily I say unto you, that is a sub-Christian understanding of human sexuality. And if that is your position, if that is your posture towards human sexuality, then you need a reformation of thought. Because the standard for Jesus is not simply whether it feels good and not whether it, in fact, harms someone else or not. The standard for Jesus is whether it, in fact, exemplifies and imitates his love for the world. And his love for the world is constituted by more than not hurting people. His love for the world is constituted by acting positively towards other people, acting for their good, for their interest. So the first thing that you have to realize is that our culture thinks that sexual pleasure is a trump card and that nothing else can beat it. Now, I, I just want to, to land on this for one second further. I realize this is hard stuff and that these are adult things. But I tell you, it's time to grow up. If it were the case that you could, let me put this experiment uh, in front of you to ask you how this goes. If it were the case, suppose that you could, in fact, hook yourself up to a machine. And this machine would, in fact, give you all of the sensations of physical pleasure you could possibly want without you actually experiencing the, 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 the activities associated with them. A sort of virtual pleasure machine. Where you could inject yourself, you could wire yourself up, think of it as the Matrix. Do people still watch the Matrix? Sure. Some people, that's good. Only the first one though. Again, let me tell you other movies you should not watch. The Matrix 2 and 3, do not watch them. They're terrible. Matrix 1, it's all right. Suppose you could hook yourself up to the matrix and experience all of the physical pleasure you could possibly want without engaging in the activities. If you wanted to eat the best food in the world, you could experience that pleasure without actually having the meal, and then you could do it again the next hour so that you could have this constant sensory overload without ever being forced to deal with the ramifications. Would you, in fact, do it? Now, I'm going to bet money that you think the right answer is that you shouldn't. But that really, somewhere deep within, you think, well, what would be the problem? If I could have all the physical pleasure I could possibly want, why wouldn't I? I think our secular friends and neighbors are, in some sense, more honest than us. They're just going to say, absolutely. But here's the problem. You were made for more than the sensory experience, the physical pleasures that are attached to living in this world. You were made to do meaningful activities. And meaningful activities often require work and pain and struggle that are, in fact, themselves not pleasurable. The only reason to get married is because it's good, not because it provides physical pleasure. But we tell you 
in our teaching to high schoolers within the church, we tell you that, we should, that you should wait to get married to have sex. And you should. But what we need to also tell you is that the joy of sex will go away unless you are embracing the sort of cruciform life, the way of the cross, and you are engaging in the sort of death to self that Jesus calls you to, and that the good stuff in marriage is in fact reserved for the last five years, not the first five months. Because if you don't get married believing that, you won't stay married. Or you won't stay married very well. You'll live together. But who wants to live with someone? But I say to you, the good stuff is at the end. I would not go back and repeat my first years of marriage. As much fun as they were. They are nothing to the goods that await. Nothing to the joys that await. And mostly the goods and the joys that await us at the end of our lives are not those of sex. They're those of fellowship and of friendship and of companionship and of being known and of knowing someone. And so if your approach to marriage is I just want to hold on. I just want to hold on to my virginity so that I can get there to day one, so that I can, you know, have sex, I can let it go, and I can experience this good that I have waited my entire life for. You have an impoverished understanding. And Jesus calls you to more than that. And increasingly, in our culture, you will have a harder and harder time hanging on. So the first thing you have to realize is that the goods of life include physical pleasure. Have I ever said in anything that I've said so far that in fact sex is bad and you shouldn't pursue it? No! It's good! It just doesn't happen to be the greatest good. And in fact, if it's taken outside of the context for which it was made, it will cease to be good. You might experience the, 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 the momentary physical satisfaction. And so trick yourself into thinking that's the highest good. But I say to you, on the far side of eight years, seven years of marriage, excuse me, going on eight years, that the momentary physical sensation is only meaningful when it's set within the whole of a life. When it's set within the whole of our time that is shared together. So don't buy the trick, don't buy the lie, that it would be good to hook yourself up to a virtual pleasure machine. It wouldn't. You're meant to do hard things and to experience goods that will endure require sacrifice. The second thing that our world teaches about sex, and I think this is painfully obvious, and I've already said it in so many ways. We think that sex is something that people need. Now, you can hear this even within our churches. When I got married, we were handed a, a, a very earnest and well-intentioned book that happens to be completely wrong. Um, this book has sold millions of copies within the evangelical world. It's a book by the title of His Needs, Her Needs. And the entire premise of the book is that in order to avoid divorce, you have to meet each other's needs. Now, first off, if you're going into marriage thinking, how can I avoid divorce? You're probably doing it wrong. The point of marriage is not avoiding divorce. The point of marriage is... Being married, because being married is awesome. And being married is a good that deserves protection, so you have to be strategic about protecting it. I'm not saying be silly or be blinkered or be blind. 
You understand that there are threats to this good and you protect against the good, that you protect against them, but you do that for the purposes not of avoiding divorce, but because this is the sort of good that is so good it demands every part of your attention and your care. So that's the first problem that I have with the book. The second problem that I have with the book is that it positions the male and the female in a marriage as oriented towards the satisfaction of each other's needs. Now, need is uh, interesting language. We certainly have needs. We need food. You do not live long outside of the special grace of God which is to say a miracle, which is possible but unlikely, without food. If you do not get the food that you need, you die. Now, I know that you paid money to come to this conference, uh, and you paid money for remarkable insights like that one. So you're welcome. But the fact that we have needs like food does not entail that our sexual desires are, in fact, them themselves also needs. Let's talk about the Bible for a second. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says some interesting things. Paul always says interesting things. They're particularly interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for our purposes, but you should read all of Paul multiple times. That's just for free as well. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, food is for the stomach. And the stomach is for food. Now pop quiz, Bible kids. Who can complete the sentence? Anyone? Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But, close, not quite yet. He says, but the Lord will destroy them both. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But the Lord is going to destroy them both. Now, does that mean, in fact, there won't be food in heaven? No, I don't think so. What I think that means is the dependence of our bodies on food that we currently know here and now will, in fact, not be the case when we get our glorified bodies in the, new, in the resurrection from the dead. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks of our resurrected bodies as being incorruptible which is to say, incapable of corroding, incapable of breaking apart, even if they don't get food. So this need that we have for food here and now is in fact not a need, will not be a need in heaven. He goes on to say, in the context of sexual ethics, the body is for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. And God will raise them up on the last day. Which is to say, your sexual desires, your sexual life is something different than your need for food. It's similar to it. They're both desires of a sort, but where you, can, where you have to get food in order to live, you don't actually have to have sex in order to live. Again, I don't know if this is rocket science to you, but we live in a world where obvious things have to be said and defended. And the fact of the matter is that, by and large, we speak of our sexual desires and urges as needs. And what ends up happening is that it becomes a manipulative tool in the hands of bad men to get women to do things that they should not do. Because I've got needs. Which is to say, you should do what I want now. There's a demanding pressure that gets attached to the language of needs, such that the other person becomes necessary to my human flourishing and fulfillment. But even within a marriage, the other person can never be necessary. 
The structure of love within a marriage, the structure of human sexuality goes something like this. It's not a need, it's a gift. In 1 Corinthians 7, to stay with the Corinthian theme, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says that the husband has authority over his wife's body and that the wife has authority over the husband's body. So technically, Paul says, you each have the right to ask. But he says it very carefully. He says, because this authority exists, you should give to each other. Not that you should demand. And in fact, later in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says that he has authority to take money from the Corinthians. He uses the exact same language. And he says, I will not use the authority that I have for the sake of the gospel. Which is to say, within human sexuality, anyone who says they have needs that have to be met by the other person has undermined a Jesus-shaped sexual life. Because a Jesus-shaped sexual life is one that is constituted by giving and receiving, by the willingness to not have. It's one that is constituted by the cross, where one person says to another, this is something that I want, but for your greater good, for your interests, which I'm going to place as higher than my own, I'll say no to myself. Not to you, but I'll say no to myself. If sex is a need, then necessarily men will not be men without getting it. When previously, in previous generations, the mark of a man was not whether he was able to get sex, but whether he was in fact able to control his sexual desires, whether he was able to go through his life without experiencing sex. The mark of your manhood, the mark of your womanhood, is not that moment when you are able to then have sex, but rather the self-control that you are able to cultivate. Paul says, possess your vessels. Control your bodies in honor. And if you are not able to do that, you are corroding the nature of human sexuality as God established it to be, and you are being co-opted by the principalities and powers of this world. Now that's the second thing. The third thing that I think our world teaches us is that you simply are your sex drives. You simply are your sexual desires, your sexual identity. Now, um, identity is a difficult category and it's one that I'm increasingly growing uh, wary of in every range uh, or in every area. But this became very apparent to me uh, by watching that bastion of cultural criticism that uh, uh, um, that most insightful of shows, The Simpsons. Um, yeah, you see, I have a tough job. I watch movies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin and watch things like The Simpsons. Why? I have no idea. Um, so that I can come and talk about them and justify them to my wife. Uh, no, actually, um, in an episode from The Simpsons, uh, in December of 2010, I believe it was, Mo, who is a bartender, decides to turn his bar into a gay bar. And so he establishes a new clientele, and he makes a lot of money. And his new clientele, all of whom are, of course, gay, want him to run as the first openly gay city council member. Now the problem is, Mo is in fact not gay, which is a problem if you're going to run as an openly gay city council member. Well, he decides to do it because he doesn't want to lose his constituency. And he's on the city steps announcing his candidacy. And Homer comes along and decides to out Mo as, in fact, not being gay. 
This is all very sort of paradoxical and ironic. Um, so that was, whatever that whistle was, was charming timing. Um, <laughs> Jeremy's phone. That was Jeremy's phone. I believe that. That guy. So Mo is on the city steps, about to announce when, when Homer comes and outs him. And when the news breaks, and the gay community realizes that Mo is in fact not, me, not gay, in 23 years of The Simpsons, they utter the most insightful line I think I've ever heard. One of the gay guys says to Mo, but Mo! How could you lie about who you are when who we are is all we are? Which is to say, how could you lie about your sexuality? Because that's who you are. That's, in a sense, all you are. The core, the entirety of your life is constituted by this identity which is to be a sexual person. Now again, again, this is true in our evangelical churches as it is outside of our evangelical churches. And again, the inability to conceive, to imagine of a life of flourishing, fulfilled singleness, flourishing and fulfilled abstention from sexual activity, suggests that we tend to think of people's identities and lives as constituted by their sexual and relational life. Now, if it's true that who we are is our sexual identity, gay or straight, and it's possible to be, as I just said, um, to have your straight identity be the entirety of your life, if that's true, then there can be no disagreement with other forms of sexuality without me hating who they are. Because who they are is all they are. There can be no disagreement, there can be no objection to that particular form of life without me not accepting, not welcoming them as a person. And so the cultural message makes it impossible for Christians to communicate love to our friends and neighbors who we disagree with while still disagreeing with them. But this is hard. But what it means is that our understanding of human sexuality needs to take into account the fact that you are more than your sexual life. That in fact you relate to Jesus. That you are a person made in the image of God, a person made to make things in this world, a person made to create, a person made to have a life beyond the bedroom. And if you will wrestle with that, if you will integrate that fact into our lives, if we will see the ways in which Jesus as the Son of God in making us sons and daughters of him opens up new possibilities, new prospects for our lives beyond those of getting married and having children. If we will see that he may have called us to certain tasks in the world, that there is a vocation on your life to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. If we will see and seek first the kingdom of God above all else, then we can carve out a space for a conversation and a way of relating with people that does not begin and end with their sexual desires. And so the gospel, the fact that Jesus loves us and died for us, intrudes and must break apart our current understanding of sexuality and reassemble it with a better one. Reassemble us with a better one. Now, let me in fact stop there for a minute. I've said a lot. I've said a lot of difficult things. Let me just recap. Three things. 
Pleasure is all you need as long as it doesn't harm anyone else. Pleasure is all you need as long as it doesn't harm anyone else. You've got to have sex in order to be human. It's a second message. And in fact, your sexual life is all you are. It's your identity. Those three things, I think, are at the core of our cultural logic about human sexuality, and in fact, at the core of all of our problems about human sexuality. But let me stop there for a minute. Perhaps you wrote some questions down based on what I said. Perhaps you ignored me altogether, in which case, that was bad of you. <laughs> But if you did write a question down, or if you do have a question based on something that I've said, I'd love to take it now. We're not done yet, so don't get crazy and don't start thinking about what's going to be for lunch, because that's still a long ways off. And I know you're high school guys, and that you know feels like it should be next. Um, but you're not hobbits, either. Um, that was too nerdy of a joke. I apologize. So let me say this. When I say that desires are sinful, um, I'm working with a broad understanding of sin. I think I act in, and I desire sinful things that I don't choose all the time. So I didn't choose to have that desire. In fact, someone may have, you know, I'm open to the possibility that somehow Satan put me in particular circumstances such that I was tempted to have that desire. And if I yield to it, that would in fact be itself. I would be morally culpable for that. Um, so I don't think the brute fact, this is helpful clarification, thank you. I don't think the brute fact that someone has a desire demonstrates that that desire was in fact sinful. I think if they have an ongoing pattern of that particular desire, probably what that means is they're yielding to it on some level. Why is that? Look, we, we talk about sex so much, right? At some level in my life, at some point, I hope that I get on to more interesting sins. Right? It turns out, lusting after other women, it's only so interesting for so long. Do you know it's a really bad sin? Pride. We should talk a lot about the way in which pride shapes our life. Because people are tempted to pride all the time without realizing it. People take speaking opportunities because they think they'll somehow enhance their platform or give them experience, not because they care about the people that they're speaking to. That's an interesting sin, and that's one that deserves repentance. All sins deserve repentance, but some sins actually are harder to, to notice than others. And if our constant obsession is with the sexual sins, we'll never reach the point where we're seeing those deeper ones. And in fact, I will say this, one of the ways in which Satan would want to keep you immature in your Christian life is to keep you overly focused on your sexual sins so that you can give the more respectable, quiet sins of pride and envy and anger a pass because you are so obsessively focused with not lusting. So be careful of that. That's a possibility. Let me say this about Jesus as well. Um, our goal uh, here has been to um, understand how the world talks about human sexuality and to understand how different Christianity is than that. Um, one of the things that we struggle with as Christians is, I, I, I alluded to this earlier, but I think it deserves highlighting. One of the things that we struggle with is showing healthy human sexuality. The reality is, if it's words versus Hollywood, Hollywood's going to win every time. If you are filling your life with stories that grab your emotions 
in ways that are contrary to the plans and purposes of God, then you will have no emotional capital left to be drawn to the real good, which is the Christian story about marriage. And so partly what you have to realize is that in speaking and in thinking about human sexuality, at the center of it is an understanding of the way in which your desires are actually formed. And your desires are formed by those things that you think are good and beautiful. Why is it that when, historically, men wished to speak of love, they did so using poetry. Why is it that today we don't even speak of love at all? Instead, we speak of having sex, or more crassly, among the male folk, getting some. Why is it that when we talk about being real about sexuality, what we don't mean is something like reading poetry. What we mean is having a frank medical conversation about body parts. Why is it that real talk about human sex is determined by the sex therapists and not the poets. Partly, that's because we've been tricked, even in our speaking, to think that. To think that sex is simply a mechanical, material thing for the purposes of our own pleasure, rather than the connection of two people in love. Why is it that increasingly, culturally, let me say something weird, why is it that culturally, the most offensive things you can say, the swear words that are not allowed these days in public, are those that have to do with race, not sex. You can say a swear word increasingly in public that is a gross and horrifically offensive word for sex, but if you say something that's a racial swear word, oh boy, you're in trouble. Partly, that's because culturally, sex no longer has a sense of sacredness to us. And if sex is not a sacred thing, it cannot become a profanity. The most sacred thing to us are our racial differences, for understandable reasons. But because our racial differences are the most sacred things, the worst words we can say are racial epithets. And so what we have to realize is that the Christian message, the Christian teaching about human sexuality, treats it as sacred as a thing that should be spoken reverently about, but not idolized. And that in speaking reverently about sex, you actually, in practice, throughout your daily life, contradict the aberrant culture of of sexuality that we live in. You actually oppose, by using poetic language to speak about sex, by using metaphors and analogies and similes and all, other those, all those other devices that you've forgotten from your English classes. By using that sort of language to talk about this human reality, you actually speak meaningfully about it in ways that undermine our current sexual ethos. And so within the church, within the church, you can see this happening. These days, to be a cool, hip pastor, what you have to do is say uh, almost crass, very frank things about sex from the pulpit. When the Bible speaks about sex, though, it speaks mysteriously unless it's offering judgment on someone. When God says he's going to expose Israel and uses 
very crude language to talk about the ways in which he's going to expose Israel in the street as a uh, prostitute, it's not because it's a happy time in Israel's history. God speaks that way as an act of judgment against Israel. When he speaks in terms of desire, when he is modeling healthy human sexuality, how does he do it? The Song of Solomon, which is pure poetry. And it's meant to be poetry. And to turn Song of Solomon into a sex manual is, in fact, to misread the Song of Solomon. So realize that even within your culture as friends, the ways in which you talk about this thing with each other are forming your desires, are forming your dispositions, are making you more or less likely to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus with respect to human sexuality. The other thing that I would say is that the teachings of Christianity about human sexuality are such that are such that they can outdo Hollywood. Now we like hating on Hollywood, and I've made a few jokes against them, and those are all fun and games, and uh, you know we can do that. It's a good time. There's a lot to hate about Hollywood, but there's also a lot that they get right. And here's what they get right. Marriage makes a good story. It, in fact, makes one of the best stories you could possibly, possibly live. But what makes the good story isn't the personal fulfillment that comes from marriage. It's not that you have somehow sort of achieved a certain level of happiness. Rather, marriage is supposed to be the crux for your personal drama. Which is to say, it's supposed to be a cross that you carry. Hollywood gets it right that happy endings involve marriages. But the Christian story is that every happy ending is actually a beginning of an even better joy of an even greater good, of an even more powerful and transformative life. And that the beginning that is the wedding is merely the entryway into a world of goodness that awaits. Now I understand that many of our marriages and many of the, the parents and the homes that people come from are broken. I understand that not everyone can speak um, quite so reverently um, as I can. I also understand that no one else has the advantage of being married to my wife, and that gives me a certain sort of sense of privilege. But I will say this. What makes those tragedies tragic is our belief and our firm resolve that marriage is worth it. Because if marriage isn't worth it, again, there are no tragedies. If marriage is not the, the sort of thing that is held in high regard among us, if marriage is not the sort of thing that we view as a sacred institution, then there is no drama. There is no temptation to adultery. And there is no war for those who would overcome those temptations. There is only the sad pathetic world of people doing whatever they want at any given moment. Which sounds to untrained ears like paradise, but is actually hell. Because the world was not set up for us to do whatever we want at any given moment. The world was set up for us to do what we want within the boundaries of God's good design. And we live in a world where what we want is not that, but that which is wicked. So we have to realize that marriage is the sort of good that is worth investing in, 
even without treating it as an idol. And we have to realize that in saying that, we need to be able to tell better stories than those which are given to us in Hollywood. And as we recognize and as we wrestle with the world around us, that the fight is not always rational. That as many arguments as you give your friends for these things, as much as you go back, excuse me, as much as you go back and tell your friends what it is that you've heard or give them a new insight, they almost certainly won't be persuaded. Because the, the persuasion that they experience, the persuasion that happens will come at the end of their life. Or it will come when they see Jesus. But you will not be able to talk people into these positions. Because their emotional dispositions because are, are set up against them. And they're set up against you. All that we can do, in a sense, is make sure that our lives are in fact living um, the sort of story that God has for us. Let me stop there. And uh, let me pray for you. And then uh, Jeremy's going to come up. Lord, this is hard stuff. Um, we're grateful for your kindness and for your um, faithfulness to us. Lord, I'm so uh, thankful for these students. And again, Lord, I ask that you would invest them with a, a sense of purpose ask that you would invest them with uh, an awareness of the challenges that are before them. Not that they would be afraid, Lord, but that they would do the work that you have called them to, to become confident and bold ambassadors for the kingdom. Lord, may our arguments, may our um, reasons that we present in public not be driven by fear or anger or worry. May they be presented with nothing else besides the gracious love of Jesus and our concern for others and the world. Lord, above all, we know that um, all will be well. And we look forward to the day of your return. And we ask that you would keep us until that day. That you would guide us and give us peace. Again, we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, the one who lived, died, and rose again. Amen. Thanks, guys.